Hello, everybody, and a warm welcome to Tuesday's Football Today. The past seven days of Premier League action may well be looked back upon as a defining week of the 2016-17 season. And with us to discuss all the fallout of football writers, Gabriel Malcotti, alongside Football Today debutante, Jack Pitbrook of The Independent. Before we delve into the papers, though, and get the thoughts of our esteemed guests, let's just remind ourselves, shall we, of the results over the weekend and how it leaves the Premier League table. 34 goals in all, then, over the 10 fixtures, a bumper 28 of them flying in on Saturday. Significant results, as you can see, all the way down the list, but none more so than the one at the very top. Chelsea 3, Arsenal 1, leaving Antonio Conte's men nine points clear at the top of the table, 12 clear of Arsene Wenger's Arsenal, which all but ends the Gunners' chance of a first Premier League title since 2004. For the first time since the end of September, they're still searching for their first win of 2017 in the league after that humbling at Hull City. While at the bottom, it hasn't been tighter for over eight years. Just two points separate the bottom six. Champions Leicester among those seriously fighting for their Premier League survival. Well, Jack, Gab, let's talk about the big game, really, that was at Stamford Bridge. In the end, it was a quite convincing win for Chelsea. I mean, you were both there to watch it. What did you make of the 90 minutes? Well, I think we saw all the reasons why Chelsea are clearly going to win the title this year in that game. They were really strong at the back, as they always are, even though they conceded that late consolation goal. They were powerful and intelligent going forward. They completely destroyed Arsenal in the middle of the pitch. Like, Arsenal switched to a 4-3-3 in the first half, hoping Mm. to get an extra body in there. But even then, Kante and Matic completely dominated them in the middle. And ultimately, Arsenal couldn't lay a finger on Kante, which, as ever, was the source of the Chelsea victory. Uh, Easy to forget, Arsenal actually started quite well, didn't they, in the fixture? They did. They they, they had a chance early on. and But uh, I think Jack nailed it with the Arsenal midfield in here. I know Wenger is going to get a lot of stick. He'll probably get a lot of stick in the next five to ten minutes. Mm. The one thing I would say, though, is against a team like Chelsea in in that sort of game where Chelsea actually can afford to sit a little back with the three center halves and Conte Matic, it's really important to have a passer from deep. Mm. And Santi Casorla, injured. Granit Xhaka, suspended. Uh, Aaron El- Ramsey injured. El Nenny away. Mohamed El Nenny in Africa. Yeah. You know, not that the last two are exactly Andrea Pirlo on the ball, but, no. you know, instead you have Coughlin and, and Oxley Chamberlain, and, you know, Oxley Chamberlain has a completely different skill set and that affects you, and that's why they had to move to the three. Mm. And then the thing is then, if you have Ozil or be dropping, then they're not further up, and then it becomes more predictable, and then it's harder to find space. Mm. And it has, has a knock-on effect. I think that's absolutely right. I think the story of this season is, for Arsenal has actually been just like last season in the sense that they don't know how to play without Santi Cazorla. Santi Cazorla is not their best player, but he's probably the most important one. They completely fell off a cliff last year when Cazorla hurt his knee in November. This year is his ankle in November. Yeah. Suddenly the team can't function anymore. Let's just um, tell the viewers exactly how it was reported here in the UK then. So Sunday Express supplement, have I got blues for you? Hazard Wonder Gold seals it uh, with their match report. And uh, the Sunday Sunday Mirror Sport. Conte has it in the bag. Arsene Wenger forced to back London rivals Chelsea for the title after seeing his side ripped apart at Stamford Bridge. I mean, as you can see, identical pictures there because of Eden Hazard and quite rightly so because that second goal was one of the, one of the ones we're going to remember this season for. Yeah, like I think Hazard has been brilliant since he's been here, but he's been kind of waiting for that signature moment. Now he's got it. Like this is a goal which will be showed over and over and over again for years. Whatever he does this year, I mean, he's obviously going to win the title. He's probably going to win Football of the Year. He will always be known for scoring this goal and because it, it kind of encapsulates everything which makes him such an exciting player. It's funny you say signature moment. I, I completely agree with you. But we're also talking about the guy who scored the goal, the, the two title deciding goals the last two years, of course, two years ago for Chelsea yeah. and last year, yeah. which to benefit Leicester. <laughs> course, and yeah. still, this goal so special that you know it might outrank them. Yeah, I mean, it, it's a, a transformation in not only one player's fortunes, but it you know, epitomizes what Chelsea themselves have gone through since the last time they only played Arsenal back in September. Yeah, completely. I mean, Azard is so completely encapsulates the transformation of Chelsea. Mm. I think he's a player more than anyone who's responded so well to Antonio Conte's management. He's learnt his position in the new system. He really respects Conte, not just for his the kind of quality of his own playing career, which makes a big difference, I think, with that Chelsea team, but also with his with his kind of warm, honest personality around the ground. And I think that 
no player has improved more this season for Chelsea than Hazard. Yeah, and that takes us on very nicely to the highlights of the, you know, his statistics. Just look at what he's delivered to this time last season. I mean, yeah, ten goals, clearly, you know, um, goals has been very much part of his game in this campaign. Fifty-one attempts, his shooting accuracy is is higher, crossing. But look at the dribble success. I mean, that hunger is there, isn't it, Gab? And we can see that from him. I think one big difference, and I had this conversation with somebody who's, who's very close to Jose Mourinho, actually, Duncan Castles, about this. Mm. Uh, and, you know, because you know, Mourinho came out with his quotes after Leicester saying, like, oh, you know, it, it effectively saying, you know, when I won with, with being sort of defensive and good on the counterattack, I didn't get credit. Now this year, mm. you know, you're all talking about how great Conte is. I think there is a fundamental difference here, though, which is um, in this system, the system is designed to... Uh, take defensive responsibility or off-the-ball responsibility away from, from Hazard and Pedro or William or whoever's there. Yeah. Remember, a lot of Mourinho issues, you know, he wanted hard-working wingers and mm. Hazard worked hard. And there's pros and cons to it, like everything. But if you look at something like, you know, dribbling success, obviously when you get, when, when you've been tracking back and then you get the ball and you got to go past somebody, you're not going to be as clear-minded. You're not going to be as lucid. You're not going to receive the ball in such favorable positions. Mm. And so as a, as an, you know, it's going to have a knock-on effect on your ability to beat opponents. He's also been very responsive to what Antonio Conte has said to him. And, and you can see that. I mean, how much of mm. his rejuvenation is down to the way you know, Conte has man-managed him, do you think? Yes, there, there's like a personal aspect there, which is his relationship with Conte, which is very strong. Conte... Conte has, like I said, he has this authority with the players and that makes a huge difference. I think Gab made a really important, important tactical point there as well, and that's that one of the most important people to Hazard's success this year is Marcus Alonso. Like having a left wing back behind him whose job it is is to track the opposition right back means that Hazard doesn't have to worry about that. And that was under Mourinho where Hazard would sometimes get caught out would be the opposition right back going past him and he'd have to go all the way back and then it would kind of affect, it would unbalance his game. So there's, a, there's both a p- personal and tactical reasons. He's a completely different player this season. It, it seems strange. We talk about Marcos Alonso, um, and you know, people may remember him from his time at Sunderland, Bolton. And I have to say, when they signed him at the other transfer window, even people in Florence are like, oh, so much money. Yeah. But you know, sometimes if you have a system, it's about getting a specialist in that system. And I know in your mind you're thinking Steve Guppy right now for <laughs> obvious reasons, but I... Marcos Alonso is not a superstar no. left back. He but, didn't look like a natural fit when he was first targeted. But what he, what he does do is he has a tremendous delivery. Mm. Um, he has a size of a, of a, of a, and a strength of a center half. Mm-hmm. He's, a threat, he's an aerial threat on, on set pieces, both taking them himself yeah. and being in the box, as, as we saw with uh, yeah. was a set the, header. the first goal with the header. Yeah. Um, and... You know, if he has a quick guy behind him, or you know, if he's got an extra defender behind him, he's more than capable of playing in that role. And and he's also a wonderful contrast to Victor Moses on the other side, who, who's got this energy. So in some ways, mm-hmm. if you look at Chelsea, if you were to look sort of from a camera up top, and there is, you know, there are just tracking software mm-hmm. that does this, it's actually often an asymmetrical team yeah. because what he does is very different from what Victor Moses does, but it creates and it complements the front two. Yeah. Or sorry, the, not the front two, but the two behind Diego yeah. Costa. Yeah. And yeah. that overlap to Moses has been so important this year. Like so many goals we've seen Chelsea score have been to do with Moses overlapping on the right and they have played in the middle or on the left and they switch it to Moses exactly the right time before the opposition left backs realise and Moses puts the ball straight into the box and they score. Yeah, we also saw another impressive performance in a big game from Angolo Kante. I mean, this is a feel it is it not that just almost appears to be getting better as the season is going on yeah it's astonishing really I know that um, he explains not just Leicester's title last year but also Chelsea's title this year and even Leicester's appalling season this year like it's no like Claudio Ranieri said in private I think that losing Kante is like losing two people out the middle of the pitch it's, um, it's I'm ne- I can't remember the last player I've seen who brings that much energy mm. in the Premier League the, I think there's no superlatives left for him no. and, one of the things, and if you watch Conte carefully, it just jumps out. I was speaking to, uh, to, to a scout recently about Conte trying to wrap my head around, you know, is there something we've missed? And he said, if you watch, he, for, for a central midfielder, he almost never goes to ground. Um, and what that means is that he, you know, we, we love the whole idea of the sort of blood and thunder. Yeah, 50-50 tackles yeah. and the rest, yeah. 
he gets into 50 50 tackles without going to ground, which no. means that even if he loses it, he's still there to contest yeah. it again. Yeah. And if he wins it, he can either run with it or he can or he can deliver it to a better position. And he can do that. I mean, it's not like people go into 50 50 tackles because they're psychopaths. Uh, yeah. They do it to be able to stretch. He's so quick. He's got such quick feet, such a low center of gravity that he can do it while remaining on his feet. Mm. And, and that's just something which is, yeah. which has to do with his body type, with his athleticism, with his intelligence. It's extremely rare for a guy in that position. We talk a lot about what exactly explains why Chelsea have been so much better in this 3-4-3 than at the start of the season where they have this kind of 4-1-4-1. And I think at the part, it's that Conte didn't really get Kante right from the start. Like no. he was playing Kante as a sitter, like he was a kind of Makalele player, which he's not at all. He's a runner. And and now he's playing the two alongside Matic. Chelsea have found a system which makes the most of his running power, which mm. is of course the best part of his game. Yeah. And it's incredible that he's the top tackler in the Premier League over three seasons, which is made even more remarkable by the fact that he's played in the Premier League for two of them, <laughs> which goes to show exactly what his tackle count is like. But Antonio Conte, the Chelsea manager, says this to was followed up with some journalists afterwards saying, you know, why the animated reaction? And he said, well, he gets tired by the time he reaches the final third and he needs to improve on that. Mm. Just when all of us are thinking that he is your, your you know, your perfectly well-rounded defensive midfielder. Yeah, but that's Conte. You know, he is super demanding and he assumes that there is always room for improvement with everybody. I think where Conte, I'm told, has improved uh, as just, just as a person is he's realized that there are some players that you can say that to mm -hmm. and they'll take it as constructive criticism yeah good point actually. and other players who you you know if you say that you lose them. they're kind of like wait a minute you know what They've do you gone. want from me he did fall out with players um, if he's learned from that and if you know going forward and it's easy to do when you keep winning obviously um, that is, is a big plus but <laughs> that's very Conte to go to N'Golo Conte and you know say alright these are the 10 things you did wrong in the game <laughs> yeah I mean, we, uh, he is brilliant with his body language is Antonio Conte I mean the way he celebrated one of those goals was exquisite it, you know, he, he obviously celebrated um, with the home crowd for the alternate view here on Chelsea um, Martin Samuel writes a very Intriguing article in the Daily Mail from yesterday on Monday. Don't crow Chelsea. It should be a title win in a row. Um, and this is what he says. There's an alternate take on this Chelsea. Towards the title. Perhaps the record books, if they can amass 37 points from the last 14 games, they represent the greatest missed opportunity in recent football history. No club has taken the league four years in succession, but Chelsea should have done. Um, for all their success this season with Chelsea, there remains a sense of what might have been. Now, he's saying that they should have won um, the title the year before they actually did. They should have won it ahead of Leicester last season. And then, of course, this season. Uh, does he have a case in point? Because he's talking about the fact that the players have always been there, but the manager at the time didn't get the best out of them. Yeah, I don't agree with Martin there. I mean, seemingly the first season which he takes here was the 2013-14 season, where Chelsea did come close to the league before blowing it. Mm. But I think City had a better... City, who eventually won the league that year, probably had the better players. Liverpool, who also nearly won the league, of course, had Luis Suarez and some other decent players. So I think his argument doesn't wholly stand up in that season. You could just as easily say that City, the great City team built kind of 2010-2011, has arguably been at a higher individual level over the course of that time and have under and has therefore underperformed just as much as Chelsea. Yeah. Yeah, I, I implied in this because you know if you're talking about why did they finish 10th mm. last year, mm. um, you know you're going to point it to Mourinho and conflicts and whatnot. But Mourinho is also what helped them win the title before. I don't know that you can necessarily, you know, separate mm. those two things. If you had an omnipotent omniscient Mourinho, who was perfect and never made a mistake, that yeah, maybe they would be on their way to, to the fourth title. But you know, that's not that's not what he is. Mm. Uh, so so yeah, I don't. I mean, I think that's a bit. I'm, I'm just kind of underestimating some of the other teams in the league. So if you then take maybe just a, a fraction of the sentiment that Martin Samuel is coming out with, how can the same, largely same group of players from last season turn it on to such an extent to this to such incredible um, differences? What do you think? I, I think there has been individual improvement. We've I mean, like you have this. Hazard and Costa, for no, example. Look. They look unrecognizable, do they not? Antonio Conte came in in the summer and he basically told the players, 
um, I will be the first one at the training ground and the last one to leave. And any kind of extra training, extra support you want, either me or one of my assistants will be there for you. My door, you know, and he he showed it by basically almost sleeping at the training ground, right? Mm. So that's how he won them over. And but this idea, though, that is so transformative, and you know, there is, I think, some level of random variation. Courtois was injured last year and had an issue mm. with the goalkeeping coach at the time. I think that's pretty mm. much. Uh, Conte wasn't there. Alonso wasn't there. Moses wasn't there. Matic is a guy who I think has improved. I don't think he was anywhere near as poor last season as people remember. Right. And I think Diego Costa and Eden Hazard, to some degree, you could chalk up to some level of, of variance. I mean, these are good players mm -hmm. who had bad seasons. You know, Conte improved them a little bit. But to say that, oh, as we all decided to be rubbish for a season to see what it would be like, and now this year we're back, I, I mean, I think that's a bit of a... It's a bit simplistic. Okay. Jack? Yeah, I kind of half agree, although I do think that one of the big problems last year was the damage that Mourinho had done to the morale of the players. Yeah. Uh, that, I mean, that's, that is, Emanalo was explicit that that was what he was sacked for. I think he lost the confidence of those guys was completely on the floor. No, I agree with you, but season. that's not something you can blame the players for. No, 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 no. I think I that's Mourinho. down to the manager. Yeah. In terms of the Premier League title, where do we stand? Is, is, is it Chelsea's now? Is this it now, in terms of the race? I don't think it's it. No, this is that the, there's 14 games to go. Nine points is a big league, but certainly by no means unprecedented. If you look in certain positions, I think Chelsea still are a little are a little thin. I mean, mm. if if Diego Costa goes down, you know we've seen them play with Pedro, but it's obviously not the same thing. No, um, not Batshuayi. You don't see him cut, slotting in. I don't think Conte likes him. No. I don't think Conte sees him not, in. But then that begs the question why they didn't get a reserve striker in over January. Well, I think they thought about getting Fernando Llorente, but couldn't get it over the line. Because yeah. Llorente's obviously a guy that Conte's worked with at Juventus and at least knows the Premier League a bit by now. The thinking with Llorente was that he would be a quick fix. Yeah. You know, um, but they didn't want to commit a lot of money to him. And I think understandably, or under, un, they didn't want to commit a lot of money to the role. Uh, and I think understandably. Um, so no, I think there's still things to go and wrong. And there's also a vulnerability with David Luiz. Like he's been one of the best players in the, in the whole country this season. Mm. What he gives is this kind of unique mixture of one-on-one -on -one defending, bringing the ball out from the back, pace and power. And there's no obvious replacement for him in that squad. And so if he were to get injured, they might have to have a bit of a yeah. rethink. That's a really good point. And that's one thing that Conte is very aware of. So this system that he has now also relies on people who have unique skill sets. Mm. So I mean, we talked about Alonso before. If Alonso goes down, you can play as Piliqueta there and whatnot, yeah, yeah. but they would play the position differently. Yeah. So, and it's the same thing, David Luiz is not somebody who can easily be, be replaced in-house, so that would have a knock-on effect throughout the rest of the team. Maybe next season, if Christensen comes or whatever, that's a different issue. But for now, that is stuff that, that, that's something he's very aware of. On the flip side to events at Stamford Bridge, Chelsea are the big winners, of course, so their grip on the Premier League title race um, tightens further. Uh, for Arsenal, though, this is how it was reported in, in the Star Sport on Sunday. A bridge too far, it says here. Um, it's game over for Arsenal after gap grows to 12 points. And it says here Wenger effectively conceded the title to Chelsea yesterday as pressure mounted on the Frenchman. Uh, Wenger lacks ruthlessness and managerial rivals will talk about that in a second. That's from um, today's Telegraph. I mean, it, it's interesting for Arsenal, it, four defeats from the last nine. Of course, it follows hot on the heels of what happened against Watford, which in itself was a hugely surprising defeat. Here we are in February, now talking in terms of Arsenal's title hopes are over with 14 round of games you know, left of the, of the campaign. There's an all too familiar feel about this for Arsenal fans, isn't there? Yeah, I mean, what's hap what has happened in the last week or so is exactly what happens almost every year. Like, they went into that Watford game with, you know, it should be one of the easiest games of the season, really, Watford at home. And yet, Wenger said afterwards that mentally they didn't show up. He said the players weren't mentally ready for the challenge that Watford posed them. And then after the Chelsea game, he told us that he thought the Watford defeat was still on their minds. Like, we have seen this so many times before. As soon as the pressure starts to rise in February, Arsenal players just can't produce. And that's what, and you know, this has been going on for so many years now that there's, it would be excessively optimistic to think it might be any different next year. There seems to be a, a, a huge reaction, particularly from Arsenal fans. You know, here we go again, a case of deja vu. Um, so close, but yet so far. Do you understand that sentiment or do you think this result should be put into context and with a pinch of salt, perhaps? I completely understand their sentiment because that is the popular narrative and sometimes there's a lot of truth in the popular narrative. 
I'm one of those people who thought that Arsenal were going to be really good this year. I looked at it rationally. I saw no reason that Casorla would get injured. I thought Mustafi was an upgrade at the back. Uh, I thought he would get Giroud more minutes, and I thought, look, this is going to work. They're, they're going to be better rounded, better settled, and they're not going to fall apart. And <laughs> look what I know. And you know what? I, I, I struggle with this because I, I don't like it when people say, I, I kind of feel it's a cop-out for, for us who analyze the game and fans who analyze the game when we talk about mental strength mm-hmm. and, and bottle and desire and soft center and all this stuff. Yeah. Um, it's kind of like when we can't explain it, that's what we turn to, right? But on the other hand, that's kind of the evidence ahead of us when you see the Watford result mm. and you see that, that Chelsea game. When I was there, at one point, Chelsea were 2 0 up and there were 15 minutes to go. And I thought back, and this shows you how incredibly old I am, to Chelsea playing Arsenal years ago when they were 2 0 up and Kanu scored a hat trick in the last 15 minutes. Yeah. yeah. And I thought, this isn't going to happen with this. Arsenal, there was no way it's going mean, to It was improbable when Kanu did it, right? Yeah, yeah. But I thought, you know, that team had Petit and Vieira and Ray Parler and, you know, Martin Keown, like, waving his arms at the back, and, and there was an anger there, and it was, you know, this team had been beaten to a pulp, mm. you know, and, and they were obviously not going to get back up. Yeah, that was 17 years ago. You're not that old, Gav, come on. Um, but it, it, in terms of the tactical now, we saw from Arsene Wenger, I mean, you've already mentioned, Jack, yeah. they went 4-3-3. So we, should, we, should, we, should, we were showing a bit of adaptability yeah. from Arsene Wenger, veering away from the 4-2-3-1. But we did see that back four exposed by the front five of Chelsea. So did we all, did that highlight, if anything, the lack of adaptability of this Arsenal side under Wenger? Yeah, in part. I think it's a, it's a squad which doesn't really know how to play in different ways. And this, I think, is one of almost the biggest problems that Arsenal have, is they have one way of playing, and usually in this 4-2-3-1, so the Chelsea game was slightly different in that regard, and mm. Wenger did go back to 4-2-3-1 at half-time. And they are, they can't, they don't really adapt for the different challenges different teams face. And that's kind of one of the, that's one of the main things you have to do in the Premier League is no team is, no team in the Premier League is good enough to impose their game on the opponents at all times. You've got to measure what you do for the opponent. And that's what Arsenal can't do. There was one banner that was at the game that was saying that enough is enough in terms of, you know, um, the, the stewardship of Arsene Wenger after 20 years. He's in his 21st campaign, of course, with Arsenal. Um, we talk about Wenger lacks the ruthlessness of managerial rivals, which was the piece by um, Ollie Kay. Uh, Dave Kidd here. Uh, today's inside page of the Sun, uh, Wenger's end game. It says, should Wenger stay, many of us neutrals would genuinely love it. Um, away from the post-match red mist, he continues to be enlightening and entertaining. Um, but he says we can only hope against hope that it, it, whatever happens, it's carried out with a little dignity. So should Wenger be under pressure to keep hold of his job at Arsenal? I don't want to sound like a cliche, but he should be under pressure and the pressure should come from himself. And, I, and I'm sure it does. You don't stick around in the game this long, uh, especially with his background, if he isn't privately his own fiercest critic. Now, He's an honest guy, he's a football man, and I presume that when he doesn't change or, or he, you know, he changes in baby steps, it's because he genuinely believes it's the right thing. But I think anybody who's been around Arsene Wenger and knows people who've worked with him or spent time with him will know that, you know, I don't know how much he slept that night after that game, and I wouldn't be surprised if he went down, you know, in his, uh, you know, fix himself a cup of tea at three o'clock in the morning and replayed the whole game on his big screen mm. and took notes and, mm. you know, got on the phone to, to Steve Bold and like, Steve, are you asleep? No, what? what? Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, not, yeah. like, mm-hmm. what happened here? What happened there? Could we do that? You know, and that's what he, that's what he does. So it's not a question of, of effort. Uh, if you're asking, you know, should the club sack him? Uh, I think there's a reality there where you ha- if you are going to part ways with him, uh, you need to have a very clear plan. And I don't, I don't think you could replace Wenger with one guy. You need to replace, yeah. I think you need to replace Wenger with a technical director, director football recruitment guy, an independent guy though, not somebody who then answers yeah. the manager. You need to replace him with a manager. Um, and you really have to have the will to do that, probably more investment. Um, 
that's a big ask, and I don't know if the appetite is there mm. from the majority shareholder to do that. Jack, you, you know, you've written yeah. a lot lately about you know, Arsene Wenger at Arsenal, what the future perhaps holds. I mean, who, who do you see coming in, if anybody? Well, this is part of the problem, and I think Gab got it exactly right there, is that, one, this is Wenger's decision. Like, no one else is going to choose. You know, the contract is on the table, I believe, for him. It's but is that right, Wenger though? Is that the right position to well, be in, for, for, for a manager to decide his own future? Morally, yes. Like, Wenger should be allowed to choose how he goes. In terms of, like, the best running of Arsenal Football Club, I think that they would, they would probably be better served by the board taking a bit more responsibility and showing a bit more initiative. Uh, and also what they have to do, as Gab said, is that you know replacing Wenger is a huge job. It's arguably an even bigger and harder job than replacing Sir Alex Ferguson at Manchester United. That means that the board would have to have been putting the, you know, the wheels in motion already towards finding a whole new bunch of people to replace Arsene Wenger. And if they haven't been doing that, if they're not doing that already, and if Wenger were then to go, then they would have, they would have serious problems this summer. Why is it a bigger job? Because I think that he, I think Ferguson's actually quite a good delegator. Whereas that Arsenal, I mean, Arsene does absolutely everything at Arsenal. Like he might as well drive the bus and cut the half-time oranges. And that, you know, that, that creates problems because ultimately, you know, you, that means more people are going to have to come in to replace it. But they're just making a rod for their own back here, aren't they? I mean, it depends what, what the end game, you know, we, we speak of they, we speak of board. We like this idea, democratic idea that there's almost like a Senate of Arsenal fans. <laughs> there isn't, there is a majority shareholder his name is Stan. Yeah. And he lives, the Chips Keswick at the very top, do you know? Yes, not Only not in LA. Yeah. It's, you know, there's a majority shareholder mm. who makes these yeah. decisions and, you know, and, and that, you know, you can make jokes about he's, you know, he's American. Whatever. He will go and he will consult with people and, and he will give a line mm. and, and the club, the club will follow it. Mm. Um, and I assume... I think we're now at the point where the majority... The odd million pounds in the bank at Arsenal and everyone's That's, happy. That's been the reality of the club. Now, where it might change is, I think the, for the first time in a while, the Premier League has six outstanding managers and six very, very good teams. It's not unthinkable that Arsenal could finish not just fifth, but sixth this season and look at Europa League next year. And you have the Ozil and Alexis and um, and Alexis Sanchez situation. Yeah, mm. you know. You could have a critical mass where then you find yourself next season, you're in the Europa League, you've lost one or both, uh, maybe you can't find replacements of equal quality because mm. they, they want Champions League football, whatever. And then it could get ugly very, very quickly and then maybe then that's when Wenger decides to leave mm. and then you kind of leave behind a real mess. That is a situation that I think Stan Kroenke would want to avoid. And taking into account, I mean, obviously, you know, you have your sources at clubs, you hear what's, you know, the word is coming out of the Emirates. Uh, what does your educated opinion tell you beyond this summer? Will Arsene Wenger still be in charge? I, I can't answer that. Uh, only Arsene Wenger knows. Yeah, I, don't think I, don't, knows. I don't think he knows. I, I really don't think he knows. I think he knows that he's not under pressure. I think it's highly unlikely mm -hmm. that Kroenke will push him to the door. And it's going to be up to him, I think. I think he would love to go out with a bit of success. I think if they were, I mean, obviously they're not going to win the Premier League this year unless something very dramatic happens. If they were, with, if they were to win the FA Cup, maybe. Mm. If, I mean, if they were to win the Champions League, I'm sure he would go, but realistically, that's unlikely at this stage. But even then, it's not unthinkable that they'll be Bayern. I mean, I know crazy as it sounds because yeah. we lost them before, but Bayern aren't going through a great patch. You know, you beat Bayern, some other results go, go your way. Uh, you know, PSG are playing Barcelona, right? So that's yeah. one other big club yeah. that's going to be out. Yeah. You know, right? It's stranger things have happened. Mm. Of course. Well, of course, the Bayern tie is coming up soon as in, uh, on February the 15th in Champions League. As far as Arsenal's North London rivals are concerned, Tottenham, um, they won their ninth um, straight game at home in the Premier League at White Hart Lane. They beat Middlesbrough, of course, battling against the drop. Uh, only one goal proved the difference from the uh, penalty spot um, for Harry Kane. Um, it was Maurizio Pochettino's 100th game in charge um, in the Premier League. And his win ratio is staggering, really. 50 52%. You could make a, a, an argument for saying that they are or have been the most consistent team in the Premier League, particularly for the last yeah. 18 months. Yeah, I, and I actually think they are currently playing better than they have ever done under Pochettino. I know Middlesbrough game wasn't great on Saturday, but no. if you look over the last kind of six weeks, absolutely brilliant defeats of West Brom. was one of the most one-sided games I've ever seen. Southampton away, they were fantastic. Watford away. And of course, Chelsea. Like They're the only team, the only team to have beat Chelsea in months. They completely outplayed them that day. So they're playing so well. Unfortunately, a bit like last year, they're not going to be quite good enough to, get, to win the title. 
You can see there, Maurizio Pochettino has, has had the best record of any other Spurs manager in the Premier League era. Are I, you su- go on, I'm sorry, what, what did I was going to say, say? No, I was looking at that and I agree with you and I'm a big Pochettino fan. And, yeah. But that was the best record by win percentage, yeah. right? Yeah. You don't win the Premier League through win percentage, you do it by points. I was extrapolating the points in my mind. 1.74 points per game. In the modern era, you, if you get two points per game, in a Premier League season, you finish with 76 points, and that is roughly, in, in a normal season, that tends to be sort of the cutoff for top four. Mm-hmm. So there's a shortfall there. You know, his numbers are still Europa League numbers over that 100 games. Now, is there an upward trajectory? Yeah, of course, there is. Um, and the Europa League numbers on the Europa League budget as well. Yes. Yeah, they pay far less money than all of their rivals. And that's been, again, it's been one of the reasons why what he's done has been so remarkable. Mm. And they break even in the transfer. They don't just pay lower wages. They also... Um, Fee-wise. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Until now. I don't know. I look at what they did this summer with Jansen and Sissoko. Obviously, Franco Baldini left the club and forgive me, the, the guy Paul who Mitchell. was in Southampton, Paul Mitchell, also, head of recruitment, sudden, yeah. who was head of recruitment, mm. all of a sudden everything becomes about Pochettino. His skill set, I think, is a different skill set, is that he's a coach, he's not yeah. a director of football or negotiator. I don't know how that's going to continue and how that's going to play out. Now, Gab, you say that the title race isn't over. No. Uh, do, you, do, you, do you see Spurs as being the, the most serious challenges to, to Chelsea then? Potentially, although I think... Some of the, again, there are some thin spots there as well. I think at some point you're not going to get away with that defense. And obviously the issues with, with Rose and Alderweireld, those are big, big losses. Yeah. There's a huge drop off when, when those guys are out. I don't like Eric Dyer playing a in central defense. Oh, yeah. I kind of feel like he's shoehorned into the team yeah. because he's not going to beat out Wanyam anymore. Um, and of course, every, every Pochettino season in his career, his teams have dropped in March, April, and May. Like it just, you know, mm. it's happened so reliably, it's not, it's not a coincidence. And the big question that starts every Tottenham season is what have you done differently, Mauricio, to make sure that it's not just short term fitness that you're developing these guys, but long term fitness? And unfortunately, I mean, we could be proven wrong by events, but we'd have to imagine that we won't be and that Tottenham will dip again in the spring. So you don't see them being their closest No, I think they'll go, sure. I mean, I think they, they're playing brilliantly right now. I think they'll continue to play brilliantly. But particularly given that they will continue on the FA Cup and the Europa League, I think by the, you know, by the last few weeks of the season, they'll be dropping. And I'm, I imagine they, don't, they, won't win up, they won't end up with any trophies. Yeah, OK. Thanks for the time being. And they take on Liverpool, incidentally. And we'll be turning our attentions to the Reds of Merseyside in a couple of minutes. We'll be asking what has gone wrong for Jurgen Klopp, Klopp, Klopp's men this season. Season, as they wait for a first Premier League win of 2017 continues. Welcome back to Tuesday's edition of Football Today in the company of football writers Gab Marcotti and Jack Pitt-Brook. Next on the agenda, the surprising result really to come from the KCOM Stadium. Relegation threatened Hull City continue their rejuvenation under new manager Marco Silva with a 2-0 victory against Liverpool. It leaves the Reds without a win in five in the Premier League in 2017. One win in ten in all competitions and that being against uh, lower league Plymouth uh, in the FA Cup. And this is how it was reported. Uh, Star Sports are on Sunday, video nasty, Klopp to make flops relive a day to forget and clueless, the simple headline in the sun here, angry Klopp baffled by his cop flops. It has gone horribly wrong, isn't it, Jack? I mean, in 2017, what's behind it? What's gone on? Well, I think it's a combination of factors. Like, I can't remember the last time that a top team season has collapsed like this halfway through the year. I mean, last year, of course, we had Chelsea starting awfully, but they were never any good mm. last season. Whereas for a team to start well and then to collapse is unprecedented, I think, in quite this degree. I think it's a, well, it's all sorts of things. I think it's, it's tiredness of the players. I think it's Klopp's unfamiliarity with the English schedule. I think it's the absences of Sadio Mane, uh, Joel Matip to a lesser extent, one or two injuries, perhaps been found out tactically. And all these things have combined to make Liverpool comp- unrecognisable from the team in the first half of the season. But let's talk about the fitness issue, because to me, it seems like it's the overriding, right. it, it is the overriding issue, because it's, it's crucial the way they play and whatnot. What's difficult for me to accept last year they played a ton of games Klopp had no preseason obviously because he took over from from Brendan in October I looked at it 
So they have played, this season relative to last season, they played, they've played six fewer games at this stage. In reality, it's even more because in the, in the League Cup and the mm. FA Cup, they play Alexander Arnold and Randall and all these guys. Mm. Um, that is a lot, a lot fewer games than last season. That is a lot more time on the training pitch. That's a lot less fatigue and wear and tear on the body. Um, I don't see how fitness can be an issue. Plus, you have a learning corps, mm. so it's year two, so you knew what the fixture list was going to look like and whatever. I think something's gone horribly wrong on the physical preparation. And I don't know if maybe guys like Lalana and Firmino were running too much earlier in the season, but those guys were completely unrecognizable, and those are two hugely important players. It's that horrible mixture now for them because they're lacking the goals in recent games. But defensively, I mean, they haven't really kicked on during his 15 months in charge, have they? No, I mean, Liverpool have been, as we all know, they've been struggling defensively for five or six years. It was the great, it was even under Brendan Rodgers, it was the big problem. Mm. It's kind of amazing that they've got to this point and they still haven't got a good goalkeeper between between the two that they do have. They've still got big problems at centre-back. They've even left-back, not, not left even a long-term back. solution, is it, no, James Milner? Exactly, yeah. And he's only the only reason he has to play there is because Klopp knows that he cannot play Alvaro Moreno there. So they've got so many big issues that I think that um, realistically Klopp will need at least another window or two before he can solve those defensive problems. But what I'm not sure about is are you going to go and recruit your way out of it? Mm. Um, if I were, I think Mike Edwards is now the, right. uh, has now been moved up to. One obvious question is you have a very prolific center forward in Daniel Sturridge, a guy who's had injuries but now supposedly fit again. Mm. He is a legit saleable asset because he's an English striker who scores a lot of goals and you know, those are commodities and there are teams maybe mid-table teams even who you know we saw it last year with Benteke yeah. they, they've kind of financed the rebuild every one of these years with you know Benteke, Sterling, Suarez is that a move you make is that a move you should look at you know Jurgen because the more you keep this guy on the blind on, on the bench then you know the more his value diminishes. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. They should definitely have gotten the phone to West Ham in January who would have loved to play like Sturridge and would have paid quite a, quite a lot for him. Just looking at the spending here from Liverpool um, over the last three managers, um, Kenny Dalglish with a hefty amount, 115. Clearly, FSG you know, pushed the boat out under Brendan Rodgers, uh, almost £300 million spent. And is it a case now of Jurgen Klopp um, uh, trying to make the most of a more money-wise boardroom, whereby £71 million has been spent... But then, you know, you look at the sales, they've yeah. been equal out, are they not? Kenny with 79. Brendan clearly, despite being, having spent almost 300, he's had to sell 200 million pounds worth of talent. Jurgen Klopp, I mean, he's had to sell more than he's had to bring in. Do you remember Rafa Benitez talking about net spend? And yes. How, I was doing the math there since 2011, five and a half transfer windows. It's about 20, 20 million, 22 million pounds a year. Mm. <laughs> that's, that's roughly what it was under Rafa. Yeah. And the and the market has changed, you know. I, I, I mean, incredibly so. <laughs> it's changed incredibly so. And on top of that, you're selling your biggest assets in in Suarez, Sterling. That's what's what's difficult here. I think that was a great point you were making before with um, with Sturridge and, and, and West Ham. Uh, and and even if you know West Ham don't have all the cash up front, maybe you know maybe chuck in somebody like I don't know if they Kuyate or whatever, somebody who bring you some energy, help you out at the back. There are things. That, that you can do. Um, and, I, and I think that's something's going to come to a head in the summer because between now and the end of the season, if I'm Klopp, I'm, I need to evaluate storage. I need to find out if he fits anywhere in my system. And if he doesn't, I have to be prepared to sell. But considering the money that's available to Jurgen Klopp, for example, as we've seen there so far, does he have the ability to attract the, the world-class goalkeeper or the world-class centre-half that he possibly craves? Well, I think you'd have to say probably not. Like, even the, the best players they've bought in the last few years have been Firmino and Mane, who are really, you know, they're seriously good players, but they're not like, they weren't sought after by the other biggest clubs in the world. No. And therefore, that would suggest that Liverpool don't really have that pulling power to do with, I mean, perhaps as attractive as the stadium is and the name is, they don't really have, they're not regular in the Champions League and they don't offer the money. And that means when those two, when you don't have either of those two things, the problem is you're not going to get the best players. So therefore, should we ask the question that Liverpool are now where they should be in terms of the money spent? 
I think so. Are we expecting too much of this Liverpool squad? I think that even if they drop off and finish fifth, I think in the context of Liverpool's recent performances and where Liverpool have finished in the Premier League, you'd still have to say it was a decent season. Okay. I'm not so sure um, because of the mistakes that were made and that are apparent from the eye test. And what I would say, I mean, I take on board your point about the spending, and there's an obvious spending gap, but there's no obvious spending gap vis-a-vis Tottenham That's and those guys finish ahead of you. And the other thing is, you know, can you attract big players and buy the best players from Barcelona, Real Madrid, and Bayern? Mm. No, you can't. But those top clubs tend very rarely sell best players to each other. If you look at who the best players are on those teams and where they came from, Henrik Mkhitaryan went for a lot of money, but he came from Borussia Dortmund. That is a team that you would think Liverpool could buy players from. Yeah. Um, you know, it, 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 it's, it's up and down. It, Liverpool play in the Premier League. They have a tremendous history. They one year on, one year out. They, they'll be in the Champions League. Um, that is attractive most to, to most players, as long as you don't go and try to sign them from from Barcelona or, or Real Madrid. You know, mm. it's as simple as that. But you're saying that they, you know, finishing to, uh, fifth in the league uh, would constitute a successful season. I mean, for me, uh, you'd think a minimum requirement would be top four, surely. Well, I think the problem is that because this, as Gab said earlier, because the, the big six now all so good, the simple mathematical reality is that two good teams are going to have to not finish in the Champions League. And I think those, I mean, it would be different in different cases, but I think those two teams have to just be a bit more mature this summer and realise that they, you know, they gave it a pretty good shot this year, didn't mm. make it, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're going in completely the wrong direction. What will it add to for the fr- frustrations of Jurgen Klopp? Just looking at the results, you know, who they've done, who they've beaten in terms of the top six. And, you know, they're unbeaten as far as they're concerned. It's the Burnleys, Bournemouth, Swansea's and Hull this season who they've, who they've lost to. And look at, for example, the last campaign, you know, Newcastle they lost to. Eventually they went down. Um, Watford, albeit West Ham, did have a good season. Um, Leicester with a surprise package. But Swansea there, you can see uh, a defeat to their name. Is this a mental application from the player's perspective? I just don't understand. They lost to three teams with Italian managers. Um, uh, but uh, you're waving the Italian flag. Here, <laughs> exactly. No. Um, look, I, I think the way Klopp looks at it, and I know it's the way Mike Edwards looks at it. They look beyond the results, and they look at they look at performances. And even in those defeats, you know, you had some games like the Swansea game, which, you know. Frankly, you replay that game a hundred times. Liverpool win ninety-nine times out of a hundred. Mm. They created far more chances. You don't need to be an expected goals nerd to see that. And the whole game where they were terrible yeah. and they deserve to lose. Um, the ones where they were terrible and they deserve to lose. That's what worries you. What worries you again? The physical breakdown of the players mm. and also projecting this team forward. So, like two years from now, you could see that front three still being there, having grown together, being far more effective. Um, but in certain positions. I mean, do, do, do you see Lovren being there two years from now? You certainly don't see Milner at left back. No. You hope Mignolet's uh, not there. You hope Lucas isn't there. You know, it, it's, it, that's how you need to think. And how, how much can these players improve over time in the system? Some guys, like Coutinho, obviously can and will. Others, I don't know. Jack, you agree? Yeah, I do agree. But, I mean, ultimately, that's the legacy of bad recruitment for years. The fact they don't have... That, the fact that their best players are maybe around their peak, but they don't have that many players who are kind of coming up to that peak, and which suggests that you know they're going to have to spend a lot more money ultimately to be able to, to maintain those standards three, four years down the line. Okay, well, let's talk about um, the fallen reigning champions, shall we? Leicester City. Um, they lost at home to Manchester United. It uh, continues their wretched run of form for the Foxes in the Premier League. Three wins in the last 19 in the top flight. And some breaking news to bring you from the last 15 minutes. Uh, a statement that's been released by the Leicester City board um, to support their manager, Claudio Ranieri. It says here, in light of recent speculation, uh, Leicester City Football Club would like to make absolutely clear its unwavering support for its first team manager, uh, Ranieri. Well, there's a collective appreciation from everyone at the club that recent form needs to improve. The unprecedented success achieved in recent seasons has been based firmly on stability, togetherness and a determination to overcome even the greatest of challenges. The entire club is and will remain united behind its manager and behind its players collectively and firmly focused on the challenges ahead. So what do you make then uh, of the move by the Leicester board to release a statement today? I mean, I think it's what... It used to be known as a vote of confidence, right? Or, or and what that normally brings. Exactly. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, 
I think it was significant that they felt the need to make a to make a statement. I think there, it's obvious there are some players who are not at the level they were at last year, um, and I think it's also quite obvious that there's some divisions I think between players in the dressing room mm. um, and divisions that weren't there. Now it's easier to stay united and everything when when you're winning. Uh, when you're losing, that's when the finger pointing can get can get dangerous. I think situations maybe also not being helped by at least one player with links to people in the media, um, and I think that's something the club are, are aware of. Let's have a look at how it's been reported. In the Daily Express, then, Fox is in free fall, title defence and embarrassment. That's according to their goalkeeper, uh, Kasper Schmeichel, who certainly didn't pull any punches in his post-match uh, interview after the game at the King Power Stadium. Um, down and doubt, obviously, the first one, uh, the, the latter is about mm-hmm. Sergio Aguero, but Schmeichel blasts flop champs and warns we will be relegated. This is Kasper Schmeichel last night, tearing into Leicester's title flops, admitting they could go down because they are only just one point above the relegation zone. And then um, finally, um, to the Guardian, just to open that up a bit here, Schmeichel warns embarrassing Leicester to buck up or go down. Goalkeeper says it's time to stand up and be counted after United add to pressure on Ranieri. And just to add, I suppose, to the, the mess that Leicester find themselves in, just to have a look at some of these statistics, the only team in top five European leagues without a league goal in 2017. I mean, the first club to fail to score in the first five Premier League matches of a calendar year. First reigning top flight champions to lose four in a row since 1982-83. Uh, and it goes goes on and but the one that's not on there is they could become the first top flight team since Manchester City to win the title one year and then get relegated back in 1938 now the worrying thing is above all is that if they were in contests you know in those tight games in the last five games creating chances it would be giving their fans something to build upon the fact is they don't actually look close to scoring goals at the minute and that's now you know no goal in five games and that could ultimately come back to haunt them yeah and like last year they were they were so good to watch but they didn't create that many chances i think they were just incredibly efficient about taking chances which they made on the break but the problem is that this year because with the exception of manchester city teams know how to play against leicester they know that you sit back you don't open yourselves out onto them you don't fall into the trap which Leicester were so good at laying for opposition, that means they, those kind of balls over the top to Vardy, putting Mares in behind, all those counter-attacking opportunities don't really exist in the same way. And if you, you, know, if you don't create chances, and if your goal-scoring players are not playing as well as last year, you've got no chance. Gab, there seems almost like an inevitability about Leicester at the minute, a club seemingly sleepwalking to relegation that well, come May. Is that how you see it? I wouldn't say they're sleepwalking because he's... He's tried many different formations and combinations of players, and I think he's very aware of what you talked about, how you know people will figure out that you know the ball to Vardy eh, over the top on the counter is, is their bread and butter. So he tried to bring in players who could offer different solutions. Mm. Uh, Islam Slomani is there for precisely mm. that reason. He says if teams sit off us, then you know we'll have the big man option, and he can also play a bit with his feet, and we'll have Mares and. Originally, he thought it didn't work out at all, but uh, Mendy can provide some creativity in passing. Um, what he found, obviously, is that Golo yeah. Kante does require two people to replace him. Uh, hopefully, Ndidi can, can provide some of that cover now, but obviously, he only just came in. Uh, and that's had a knock-on effect, throw in the fact that you know, Vardy's really struggled. Mares has been like a different player. You lose the creativity. Slimani took a while to get going, then had some injuries, then had a couple of nations. Um, I mean, looking at, looking at it now, I kind of feel that if they stay up, it's going to be either because Mares wakes up or because Slimani's back mm. and, and scoring important goals. But, you know, you've met Claudio Ranieri on more than one occasion. Mm-hmm. You wrote a book about him after the terrific title win in the last campaign. One of the, I suppose, accusations leveled at him is that, you know, he's carried that tinker man. Um, uh, reputation with him uh, and it's cost him um, you know, a lot this time round in that he's gone for a diamond midfield he's switched maybe from a back four to a back three on some occasions and it's backfired what, how, would you, how do you think he'd, he, what would he, his response be to that? I think you would say the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results it's, 
you know, <laughs> it's, it's, I, I just have to laugh at this because, you know, you're a fool if you do and you're a fool if you don't. Mm. People criticize Wenger for not having an alternative yeah. game plan when things aren't going right, when people are injured. Now you criticize this guy mm. for, for changing personnel formations. I mean, the loss of Conte is so big that you have to find another way of playing. You've also added players, so you have a deeper squad because of the Champions League. So to some degree, you have to have different um, you have to have different alternatives. Uh, you've got a whole bunch of players who aren't used to playing twice a week. So that's why you have a bigger squad. That's why you shift things around. They, bringing this Tinker Man nonsense back up. No, but come on. But, is, but, but, look, I'm, I'm not suggesting you're doing no, it. No, no, no. But you're not, I know you're not one for statistics, right? Uh, everything in perspective. Mm-hmm. Um, 52 changes he's made this yeah. season. Uh, and we're not, we've still got 14 round of games left. And he, and he made 33 in the last campaign. Okay. I mean, uh, surely. Isn't that just an inevitable but, function of playing in Europe. The teams that play in Europe need to make more changes because yeah. they need to keep, keep the players fresh as far how as many, possible. You're a Manchester City fan. You probably know this off the top of your head. How many changes or, or how, many, how many times have Pep, has, how many different lineups has Pep Guardiola used this season? Almost oh. one for every match. Yeah. Right. So that's more than Ranieri. And I believe City are third in the table right now. We expect them to finish second. Uh, and, you know, it's, this is what managers need to do unless, they, they, if, if, if their squad demands it, especially if the squad is struggling, mm. especially if they're transitioning to a deeper squad, especially if there's a massive gaping hole in the middle, especially if your two best players aren't performing. You know, you move the pieces around. What's he supposed to do, sign Slimani and then not play him? Because, oh, look, I won a title last year with Okazaki and Vardy. What about Ranieri's battle against relegation? It's something that he's not, you know, he's not done uh, often in his he did it, career, he did it many times you know, as a player. Yeah, but as a manager, um, he's never, you know, he, he's never been in the thick of things. Particularly, of course, as manager in the Premier League, this would be you know, very much a new experience for him. Was, and does that pose its own challenges? Yeah, I was actually thinking back. Uh, I think he had it. At, um, I mean, he said it a couple of times at Cagliari, at Parma, he took over um, in mid-season when they were dead last and went on this incredible tear. But again, it's different when you come in because then you can make more changes. And I think that's one of the things that he's struggling with. I know, you know, one of the st- stories that's been speculated on is with some of these guys who maybe are perceived to be resting on their laurels a little bit. Uh, why doesn't he go and, you know, and shout at them? And is he too nice with them? And is he too loyal to some of the guys mm. who delivered the title last year? Mm. I think it's difficult when you've been Mr. Supportive, Mr. Nice Guy, Mr. Nurturing, and you've had success that way, it's difficult to then all of a sudden deliver a different message to the same set of people. Anybody who's been a parent knows that, right? If you're, yeah. you know, <laughs> if, if, if you're the pushover parent and then you start shouting all of a sudden, yeah. you don't necessarily get the results. I think no. for that reason, like a lot of the guys, or particularly the core of this team, are the guys who famously escaped relegation under Nigel Pearson two years ago. Yeah, they won so, seven of the last right, nine. Yeah, the and so even though... Claudio Ranieri might not be shouting at them. Those are the guys who now have to take some responsibility and kind of do what they know needs to be done. Ranieri might not have experience in a Premier League relegation battle, but these guys certainly do, and it's time for them to step up. We only saw one uh, new signing in the lineup against uh, Manchester United uh, at the weekend in Wilfred Ndidi, and he came, actually the deal was done before the January transfer mm-hmm. window, but then he arrived two days in. Uh, £60 million has been spent by Leicester in, that, you know, in the summer transfer window. One player's already been returned, of course, yeah, Luis Hernandez, and the only kind of defensive reinforcement to a team that has two mid-30s you know, at the yeah, centre of their defence. Yeah. Have they been negligent in terms of the, the work that they've done? Like, in I know that Hernandez came in here expecting to play quite a lot, particularly at centre-back. Like he, I know he ended up playing a lot at right-back. Yeah. He's not really a right-back. He's a centre-back. That's why he played for Sporting Gijon. But he, he, he arrived knowing that Robert Huth was tiring, that Huth couldn't train all the time, that he wasn't, that he basically lost a bit of the kind of edge that he used to have. Mm. But then Ranieri hardly plays Hernandez, certainly not a centre back. And so Hernandez goes back to Spain. Like that does suggest that there isn't that much joined up thinking between the buying and the coaching. That, I mean, and obviously Ranieri has input on recruitment, but he's not in charge of it. I think they were, they really needed to bring in and they really wanted to and were relatively close to bringing in a central defender in January. A Serbi. Possibly, okay. um, but it didn't. Uh, it, it, it didn't happen, and that's an issue because you know Morgan and Huth, especially Huth, I think have had issues, and then you get beyond that, and then you're looking at Vasilevsky, who I believe is 37 and the yeah. house, size of a house. He is, yeah. Um, and uh, even scarier than that, after that, you get into Johan Benalouan, who I think a lot of people didn't even know 
I certainly didn't know he was back at the club, but then I was shocked when I saw him on the bench. Yeah. You know, I, was like, oh, I haven't seen you since you, you know, came back from Fiorentina to celebrate on the team bus. Yeah. You know? So that is, I think, that's what keeps Ranieri up at night. It's that prospect. Do you see them staying, uh, staying up or do you actually see them getting relegated? I think they will just dig it out at the end. I think they'll be okay. Uh, I think there are probably, I think there are three worse teams than them and I think they have... I think they have two or three or even four wins in them, which is kind of all it's going to take. Maybe five wins, but I think they can do it. They have a huge game on Sunday. I mean, they're away to Swansea, who are obviously just next to them in the, in the Premier League table. Uh, you kind of fear for the losers of that contest. And that's away from home, by the way, and Leicester have failed to win one game away from home all season. Yeah, and if they get that one wrong, <laughs> then they play Liverpool, which bizarrely in this little... The, the little three three game mini cycle, Swansea, Liverpool, and Hull. It seems odd that you actually expect them. You know, the likeliest place for them to get points is against Liverpool, um, uh, given the way Hull have been playing as well. Uh, I mean, I think that's that's your season right there. I think those three games. Uh, yeah. If if they get, I think they need to get at least three points out of those three games to to have the momentum to keep going. Yeah. Um, later into the season. Well, talking of momentum, before Leicester take on Swansea on Sunday, um, they've got a chance to get at least a win on the board, maybe even score some more goals. Um, they're in FA Cup action tomorrow against uh, local lower league rivals, um, Derby County. And Claudio Ranieri has been talking in his press conference, li- literally in the last half an hour, um, about the Foxes' next game. We've had the statement from the football club in the last few minutes saying that you've got, uh, they've got the unwavering support of its first team manager, Claudio Ranieri. A real boost for you. Yes, but I think this is for you, not for me. Because I know the idea of the chairman of the club to everybody. And for me, it's okay, but I think this is more for you than for me. He's so calm, isn't he? I mean, nothing really ruffles him. He's been there and seen it all before. He's achieved the greatest... He takes it in his stride, doesn't he? He's achieved the greatest story in the history of team sport. And that will never be topped and can never be topped. Certainly not by him, not at his age. So, of course, you take everything in stride. But I do think he really has bought into it, given the situation, given what he's achieved. I think think he's realistic. Um, But... I think the sense is that even if they should go down, I think if they should go down, it's entirely likely that he'll go. But I think the club feel that they can absorb a relegation in the belief that there's enough structures in, in place mm. that they can come back up. You know, it used to, we used to have this perception that like, oh no, you go down and then you get relegated again and you turn into leads. Or, Magic, yeah. If you look at it, a lot of teams have gone down and shot straight back up. You know, Newcastle are on their way back up. Um, Norwich came back up. Norwich came back up. And, and who else got relegated last year? Uh, aren't they in the playoffs as well now? Uh, Nor- uh, hang on, where are we? Norwich. Well, it's gone well, Villa. out of my head to me. Villa. Villa. Yeah. 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 You know, and in years past, whole city have yeah. done the same thing. Mm. You know, they stuck with Steve Bruce and then they came back. You know, it's if you've got the structures in place... And if you keep most of your players... Yeah, and... It's not that difficult no. to do, frankly, because they'll be on big wages, which they won't get elsewhere. And, yeah. you know, for at least, you know, you think you need to do it quickly, mm. but yeah. it's not a, you know, it's, it's, it's not sort of the catastrophe it might have been. In- <laughs> Welcome back to the final part of Tuesday's Football Today in the uh, company of football writers uh, Gabriel Marcotti and Jack Pick uh, Brook. And next up, Manchester City, who got themselves uh, a big win against Swansea, two goals to one. They couldn't have left it much late, to be honest, um, with their sensational 19 year old new signing, who, of course, was made some time ago, but he's only now making an impact um, in his second game. He was chosen ahead of Sergio Aguero. He scored both goals. It means now for Gabriel Jesus, it's three goals and two assists in a matter of just two games and it keeps them within I suppose touching distance of Chelsea 10 points behind in the title race that's sweet Jesus now I know Gab was going to be a big fan of all the headlines in terms <laughs> of what was going to happen I saw that from your Twitter feed you can't wait for them to come out on social media um, Jesus repays faith City new boy fires title shot teenage sensation a Brazilian wonder boy Jesus starts 
Uh, Stars as City run right to reignite their season. And that was after the West Ham game in midweek. But of course, it was very much the same afterwards. The game move over Sergio Jesus is City's new hero. Um, and then the second coming, Pep Hail Jesus uh, after double. I mean, look, he is the, he's, I was going to say the man of the moment, the boy of the moment, because he's only 19. But what an incredible impact he's made in such a short space of time. Oh, it's it's been tremendous. But then again, we are talking about a very, very special, special player. Um, I think the fact that he knew he was coming, obviously, uh, really prepared him. I was talking to somebody who was um, associated with his old club, Palmeiras, and said, and said that, you know, he was getting continual reports, you know, dialogue from City. Um, and so, you know, he went in, he had a very clear idea. What I think he was not expecting, and this is something that's going to come out, is to be played at center forward. Um, it's something he's done before, it's something he can do. It's not where he naturally thinks he's himself. Even though he played some center forward in Brazil, um, it was much more sort of a movement oriented. Uh, style of center forward rather than really a penalty box poacher type like Sergio yeah. Aguero. Mm-hmm. I know, of course, we're all professionally um, neutral uh, when it comes to teams, but you did let slip a little earlier. You have a, a, a penchant for Manchester City, yeah. shall we say. I mean, you must be delighted with yeah. um, his, his impact. So I was lucky enough to go to his first two games, his first two starts, which were against Crystal Palace in the FA Cup last Saturday and then at West Ham United in the Premier League a few days after. And he was absolutely brilliant in both games. I was kind of, I wasn't really expecting him to be I was expecting him to be good. I wasn't expecting him to look like such a natural playing as a number nine in the Premier League. Like that first game at Crystal Palace, there was a massive hailstorm. The pitch was awful. He was getting kicked up in the air by the Crystal Palace back four. It was a culture shock, wasn't it? Yeah, and he kept on going. Like he was going for 50-50s. He was coming back into midfield to try and win the ball. And obviously that on top of all the stuff which you know is going to be good. Like you know he's going to be quick, strong, great touch, good in the box, intelligent. So I think I was kind of, I think we've all been surprised and impressed by just how complete he was in that first game. And then as we're seeing here at West Ham United, he was, um, he looked much more relaxed, much more comfortable and confident in that front three with Leroy Sane and Raheem Sterling, which Pep Guardiola has said, I think, I mean, he keeps on saying every time he speaks to the media now, Sane, Sterling, Gabriel is the future of Manchester City for the next 10 years. Mm. He's been compared in some quarters to the Brazilian Ronaldo. Can you see that? I mean, I think that's a bit over the top, without making a distinction based on on ability. Um, but you know, I think Cristiano was just even though Gabriel Jesus is strong, but Cristiano was just bigger. So Cristiano, no. the original <laughs> Ronaldo, Ronaldo <laughs> Nazario Lima was just bigger, stronger. Um, once yeah, you remember, he get the ball. Once you just start running in a, in a straight line, he was like a it's like a train. You yeah. really had to yeah. hack him. Yeah. And you could try. You just bounce off him. Mm. I mean, I think he's he's a different sort of player. I think mm. Gabriel Jesus is much more assist oriented, much more aware of the players mm. around him. He doesn't need to be the attacking terminus. Mm. Um, what's really impressed mm. me is you know the, the way you know how, you know how Pep talks about how. You know, he likes to have structure and defense in midfield and in the final third. You know, he's, the players have a lot more freedom outside of a few basic concepts. The only way you're going to get to know what De Bruyne or Silva or mm. Sterling are going to do with the ball is if you have that chemistry that yeah. comes from yeah. either from playing for them or from really studying them. Yeah. This guy has clearly, clearly studied them and knows exactly what their yeah. tendencies are going to be. You know, picking out little things like for when Sterling's going to cut inside mm. or whatever, you know, getting that half second. Mm. I mean, this guy does it extremely, yeah. extremely naturally. I mean, at West Ham, I remember there was, he set up one of the goals with a really good, he kind of played a ball inside to De Bruyne, who was running into the box. Yeah, we which just very saw good. that, yeah. At, at Crystal Palace, he kind of, he helped make a goal for Leroy Sane by making a, a diagonal run across the box, taking defenders with him, which let Sane go into the space, and then Silva played him through. So he's already got that kind of, like you said, that understanding with his teammates. Uh, which is so, impo- is so important to the front three. Yeah, and, and that's not a coincidence. I mean, you, right. you get that from doing your homework and studying and being professional. You know, he didn't get that on the training pitch. No. Mm. That, to me, is just, just speaks volumes about this guy's professionalism and his desire. And I'll tell you one other thing I was, I was told. He, unusual for a guy with that build, he relishes 
the physical, yeah, but he's the physical strong. contact. Yeah. yeah, he's strong, but I mean, you know, he'll he'll give away a number of pounds and inches to many opponents, mm. but he not only he's not afraid of it, he actually relishes it, and he'll even look for it in certain mm. in certain situations. Mm. Um, he got hacked a lot when he was in when he was in Brazil. Mm. Maybe that's one concern about him: is does he do that a little too much, and might he then pick up injuries as a result? Might his body take a beating? I, I don't know. But um, certainly, in terms of mentality, professionalism, tremendous. Uh, in terms of what it means for Sergio Aguero, and it's all very interesting because, of course, he was, again, overlooked. He started the second successive game on the bench. Um, we've seen already that he's had a v- bit of a disruptive season. He's had his mm-hmm. seven-game ban, um, which took him out of the loop for a while. He was left uh, out of uh, the Barca away game in the Champions League that pointed at the time that all wasn't too well between him and his manager, Pep Guardiola. Uh, and then, of course, once everybody saw that Gabriel um, Jesus was starting um, in the Swansea game, what did it mean for the Argentinian? And then um, Aguero released a statement. So he had some quotes to say. Uh, and this is what, what he had to say for himself. He's got three months to do uh, my best to try to help the team and we'll see what happens in my future. I have to help the team as much as I can in these three months. Afterwards, we'll see what the club wants to do with me. In three years, my contract is up, but uh, that's why I say I'm happy at the club. In these last three months that are left, I have to help the club. And as I say, the club will decide if I have a place here or not. Now, you see, it's just that last bit there that leaves it slightly open-ended. It's down to the club what they want to do with me. Makes you think... Does his future lie elsewhere? Yeah, those are not the words of a man who's confident about his place in Man City's long-term plans. I think we've what we've seen recently, and this is why Gabriel's been so good, is that Gabriel solves one of Pep Guardiola's big issues, which is how to stop the counter-attack. Guardiola is obsessed with City's vulnerability on the break, particularly the vulnerability to the long ball over the top from the opposition Mm. centre-backs. And he knows that Sergio Aguero, given that he's now 28 years old and he doesn't quite have the same physical intensity, I think, that he did when he arrived at City, because he won't press opposition centre-backs, that means that City are more vulnerable to that ball because they can't stop it from happening. Put Gabriel up front, he's so tireless in his defence that Gabriel stops the opposition centre-backs from playing the long ball, which actually makes City much more... Makes, makes, makes City much more secure at the back. And because of that, I think that's why Sergio Aguero knows that his time looks like it's numbered at City. Is a clock ticking for Aguero, Gab? I'm not so quick to, to write him off. I mean, first of all, I love the fact that he gave that answer because I love it when people are just completely honest uh, and, and, and fair, yeah. I thought. Mm. You know, he's a guy who wants to play. Obviously, if the club decide another guy deserves to start in his place, that's fine. Then, you know. Because he is still, let's not forget, a world class talent, right? Yeah. I think this is a situation, and I go back to this, it's an age old thing, a relationship between Pep and Chiki Begiristein. Mm. You know, Chiki Begiristein has seen Sergio Aguero up close the last three years, three and a half years that he's been at the club. He's a football man. You would see this coming. You know, what, what you're saying about he doesn't close down. Well, is it because he doesn't want to? Is it not in his DNA? Is it just because he's older? You expect the club to see this, to identify that this is what's happening, and to take countermeasures. What you don't want, I think, if you're City, is to have a situation where you have to sell him at a discount or whatever else. And you may have to do that anyway because he's on very big wages and he's in a position where he can pretty much dictate his terms in terms of going where he wants to go. Jack, what's strange is, and he mentions in that statement there, Aguero signed till 2020. But it's not, it's not been announced by the club officially, has it? No, well, so this is a, this is a fairly complicated matter, or it's a matter which should have been simple, but has, I think, rather been made complicated by Manchester City. Like, I understand that Sergio Aguero signed that extra one-year extension from 2019 to 2020. I right. think it was agreed like a year ago, or certainly it's basically agreed last summer, and then for whatever, for a combination of reasons, let's say, the announcement of that extension has been delayed solely through the season. It's only recently been now that people have been confident enough to report that it has in fact happened. Mm. And that does suggest kind of basically political games going on behind the scenes between Aguero and the club, which again underline why his position there might not be so secure. Um, I was unaware of, of, of this bit. Uh, right. Uh, but, you know, it certainly lends credence to, to, what's, to, what, to what we're speculating about. Let me ask you this question. Is Gabriel Jesus better than Sergio Aguero? Mm. At what? Like, I think Aguero is, a, Aguero is still an unbelievable finisher. He's, I think he's probably the best penalty box finisher in the Premier League. Uh, I think he is, he can score fantastic goals from, all, from unbelievable angles. And I think City would be a much worse team if they sold him. 
But for what Guardiola demands from his players right now, you'd have to say that, yeah, Gabriel is playing better than he can do things that Aguero can't really do anymore. Because it will be interesting now to see in the next big game for Manchester City, who he plums for, to play down the middle. Yeah. Um, or whether we'll see the two of them together. As, can you as see them playing together? Yeah, I think I wouldn't be surprised if he moves to a system whereby he has Sergio as the number nine and then Gabriel out on the left. The problem with that is that Leroy Sane is playing brilliantly at the moment and Pep doesn't really want to disrupt his confidence. I I think equally, I mean, the point you made before about Aguero pressing the centre half, you know, Pep is tactically sophisticated. You don't necessarily need to have your centre forward pressing the centre halves. There are systems where if it's not in his skill set, and we see Mm. this with some teams that, for example, have a big powerful striker, you send one of the wingers right. to the center half, the striker drops off, yeah. and you say, you know what, let's let your fullback take the ball out and let's see if he can beat us, at least we'll all be in position. Mm. You know, um, Let's challenge your fullback to try to put the ball over the top, you know, it, which is obviously gonna be easier to defend because it's coming from the side. So there are a bunch of things that Pep can do, and not the other one obviously being, he can get his defenders to drop off, which he might not like doing, yeah. but you know, there's many different ways mm. to press um, I just think Pep has had so much going on tactically and fighting fires and fixing things and making personnel changes and the goalkeeper and this and that mm. that I, I think you know I, I think he's imparted about maybe 20% of what he wants yeah. to teach his players tactically thus far and I think that's one of his frustrations yeah he's spinning a few plates I think it's fair to say at this yeah. moment in time at the Etihad Stadium and interesting of course to see that Willy Caballero um, took his position in between the sticks head of Claudio Bravo for that game um, interesting quotes from Jose Mourinho um, you could say pointed quotes from the other side of Manchester um, to Pep Guardiola this was in the build up to um, Leicester's game against Manchester United inside the, um, the Sun on Sunday. Um, Jose, he says here, you can't buy the title here, Pep. Jose Mourinho admitting it is impossible to buy titles in the way Pep Guardiola could do at Bayern Munich during his time at the Bundesliga. Uh, He thinks cherry picking in the Premier League from one rival uh, from the other um, was a thing of the past. Uh, we've seen, of course, during the Premier League, Robin, Robin Van Persie um, has gone to United from Arsenal. Michael Carrick, Dimitar Berbatov, they've all been high-profile signings. Um, you could say from so-called rivals, but not something that's done in this day and age. Um, but what do you think the motivation was here behind Jose's comments? It's just simply to go and, and needle the old... Ruffle his feathers? Once, yeah, I mean... You know, you can't do that. I, I don't know. I mean, isn't this what, isn't this kind of what Chelsea did back when he won his first yeah. titles? Well, and, that was my initial you know, thought when I read I it. I mean, I, I don't. But he says, it, it says things have changed. The landscape's changed. It doesn't happen now, especially in the last three right, years since Alex returned. Well, we'll Manchester United bought a player for £89 million last summer. And, you know, they would But very not much... domestic, not from your domestic. No, that's rivals. true. That's, that's true. the thing that's changed. So where did City buy Raheem Sterling from? Where did, well, did, 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 did Chelsea yeah. buy a guy from the Premier League champions uh, in N'Golo Conte over the summer? City I mean, bought Stones from Everton. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't... This is just this is just, just silly. You know, he just throws things out there and you ask yeah. him. And I, I, I don't... I think he's trying to buy some time at Manchester United, Maybe. perhaps. I think he was also making a specific point. That we can see it right on the page there that there are certain... Certain players in the Premier League that he would like to buy. But it's no secret that they, you know, they've had a bit... They've had a big look at Harry Kane. They tried to sign Kyle Walker. He's obviously got an interest in his old player, Mesut Ozil. Uh, Danny Rose has been talked about, but I think actually the interest in Rose is more from abroad than from England. Mm. But certainly Mourinho has not quite got the players, particularly in defensive positions, that he would like to have at Manchester United, and that annoys him. Can I make a point here too? Yeah, of course you can. Okay, yeah. and I'm not having a go at this newspaper. won't even mention it. But it says, how Pep weakened Bundesliga rivals uh, um, when, when, uh, at Bayern, right? Yeah. And it mentions these guys he signed, okay? I'm just going to go through this very quickly. Jan Kirchhoff signed for Mainz, not a Bundesliga rival, hardly played for them. Mario Goetz has signed for Dortmund, yes, a Bundesliga rival, ri- rival. Yeah. was terrible. Uh, Robert Lewandowski from Dortmund, obviously fair enough. Sebastian Rode, hardly played. Uh, Sven Ulreich is the, the, the reserve goalkeeper. Yes. Uh, Karl Heinz Lappe signed from Ingolstadt, not a Bundesliga rival. I've never heard of the guy. And, so and finally, Kimmich. Josh Kimmich was on loan at Leipzig originally <laughs> from Stuttgart. I mean, and Leipzig were in the second division when they signed him. Yeah. So this is frankly nonsense. Okay. 
And with that, we'll move on. Uh, but we'll talk about Manchester United generally as a force because we spoke about um, how Leicester uh, obviously you know, came unstuck uh, against um, Jose Mourinho's side. But United, unbeaten in 15, um, they seem to be getting stronger. It's almost a case of maybe a little too late in terms of the title race. Um, I'll say this about Jose Mourinho. When he says that they've been unlucky, he's right. Um, you know, so you do have some sympathy with them there. I've, I, I think that I think this season, and I know it's weird when we give him, <laughs> we give him credit. He's had he's had both sides, but playing this kind, he's got such a top heavy squad in terms of attacking mm-hmm. talent. Yeah, he said to adapt himself to do something, which frankly, even though he you know will come out and say, oh no, but I broke the scoring record with Real Madrid. I am an attacking manager. No, you've never had these many attacking players together. And to your credit, you've gone out there and you've made it work. On top of that, they have been patently unlucky in a number of games. Um, I think they should easily have another five or six points on the table and be roughly where uh, City and Chelsea are right now. Yeah, I disagree. I don't think they've been playing as well as City and Chelsea. I think that they've... Sorry, sorry, City and Chelsea. Uh, sorry. And City and Spurs. Sorry, sorry. Um, yeah, I've... To be honest, I've not been impressed with United. Whenever I've seen them this year, even though they've got all these attacking players, you know, they've got good attacking players on the pitch, I still don't think Mourinho really trusts attacking players to go and do what they need to do. I don't think they, I don't think they're very good on the ball, despite the talent they've got. I don't think he's really fully integrated to Paul Pogba yet. I think that they've been incredibly reliant on Zlatan Ibrahimovic, and who's certainly got them out of a lot of holes this year. Yeah. Um, 20 goals from him yeah. now. It's, it's a great return. He's, yeah. And, ha, ha, you know, Zlatan's done brilliantly. He's been great to watch and great for the Premier League. Overall, I, you know, I think I've been pretty underwhelmed with United, and I think that even if they go and buy a, a, quite a few more defenders and defensive midfielders in the summer, which it looks like they're going to do, mm. I'm still not that confident they'll be able to put up a serious title push next year. Interesting. Okay, well, let's have a look at the uh, forthcoming fixtures in match week 25 then um, in the Premier League. Uh, it starts uh, at the Emirates for Arsenal against Hull City. Some big games, though, on the rise. I mean, look at that at Anfield. Um, Liverpool against Tottenham. There could be some damaging three points um, taken from their opponents there. And the huge game on Sunday at the Liberty Stadium, Swansea against Leicester. And Burnley against Chelsea as well. Burnley against Chelsea. But can you see Burnley sticking a spanner in the works? Have you seen Burnley's home record? Nine wins. <laughs> it's remarkable. I remarkable. can't remember the last team with a bigger gap between their home and away record than Burnley. I think they've taken one point on the road all season, yet yeah. they're still going to stay up. It's a huge contrast. They've got the third best home record in the Premier League, Gabby. You're quite right. I mean, they've been formidable at Turf Moor. Could you imagine if they actually put a spanner in the works and then suddenly everything becomes just a whole lot more interesting? They're also a pretty physical, hard-edged team and, you know... Chelsea on paper yeah. have you know all these big physical guys, but you wonder. I wonder if, if there's going to be maybe some wind up. I almost wonder maybe this isn't a game that Diego Costa rests. Who knows? Okay, we're going to have to leave it there. Gab, Jack, thanks very much indeed for your company. Thank you too as well for yours as well. Don't forget we'll be back here to do it all again next week. But from all of us for now, goodbye. 